Sketches from Scripture presents Light in the Darkness, a teaching series from the stories of Genesis. Light in the Darkness is a teaching series by me, author and filmmaker Paul Andrew Skidmore. In this podcast, we'll be exploring the narrative structure and style of the book of Genesis as context for better understanding of Scripture. This will help us trust more in these scriptures by demystifying them, taking the stories from the perceived realm of mythology or spiritual mysticism or religious fairy tale and putting them on the ground where they belong. Real words written by real people about real events in real places, all pointing us to a very real God. I hope this podcast scatters your darkness and makes the great light abundant in your life. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others. Hi. I'm author and filmmaker Paul Skidmore. I have a blog called Sketches from Scripture. You can find it at skidmore.substack.com. Any support you give is appreciated, whether it's just reading or listening, buying books, t-shirts, mugs, paying for the blog, or especially sharing with friends. While I endeavor to live off my creative work, my number one goal is that my creative work help people see God more clearly and trust Him more deeply. Why am I qualified to teach this series? Well, I'm a curious person and I love story. Now, the content here comes from a lot of my personal study, either in the process of research for stories that I'm writing or just for my own spiritual development. While I am professionally a writer and filmmaker, I am merely an armchair historian, armchair theologian. I, I do have some good scripture study tools, some software, and uh, use a couple of excellent resources, but I did not go to school for any of the religious stuff. I just love it. And I hope that you can hear the passion about it as I talk. And I'm thankful to have some of the best theologians alive, people like Dr. Rick Oster, Dr. David Young, Dr. Michael Strickland, as personal friends. And I've learned so much from them over the years. And this podcast series, Light in the Darkness, centers on Genesis, the first book of the Bible, focusing primarily on the masterful narrative storytelling at work. My two primary resources, other than the Bible, when preparing for this series originally were Robert Alter's Five Books of Moses, which is a translation and commentary on the narrative style of the Torah, and The Beginning of Wisdom, Reading Genesis by Leon Cass. So as I've alluded to earlier, this is not an academic work, and while not academically structured or sourced, I have attempted to give credit where it's due as often as I can, and to avoid reading large swaths of copyrighted material. But if anyone has copyright or sourcing issues with anything I've presented, please do reach out. I'll be happy to make adjustments wherever may be necessary. So, without further ado, I'll launch you straight into the opening of the first live stream recording of Light in the Darkness, a teaching series from the stories of Genesis. So, <clears throat> I see a big mix of people who have sort of uh, tuned in and uh, because of that, I don't know what everybody's um, opinion about Genesis or the Bible or Christianity coming into this video would be. Um, those of us who follow Jesus and uh, trust the Bible, I think that um, we could say even, even with our varying levels of commitment, we definitely feel sort of a duality sometimes when it comes to follow Christ, that uh, the world kind of wants to go in one direction and Christianity is countercultural and it kind of pulls us in this other direction. And even if you're not a person of faith, you know, you have this uh, idea of uh, wanting to be a good person versus wanting to be a selfish person, right? So um, we want to be the magnanimous person of integrity, but we also kind of want to stick it to the person that was crappy to us, right? And so there, there's always sort of this duality of sort of the, the, the wanting to be the good person or the, the, the selfish things that we do in Christianity. We talk about, you know, uh, sort of the spirit versus the flesh. We have different uh, words to talk about it. But I think regardless of your faith and regardless of your experience with the Bible or with understanding who Jesus is, I think everybody feels that kind of duality just walking around in life. And I know for Christians, I, I assume I see this also in people that are that are not Christians, but so certainly in Christians, we tend to hide our sins and our struggles. Um, and 
part of that is um, we're afraid that um, people will not accept us or understand us. And so we kind of become ashamed of it. So what we do is we take our sins and our struggles and we try to kind of hide them away. And more than that, then we think that they have no part in our journey. We're like, well, that's not part of the journey. This is the thing that I'm doing here, you know. And um, so, so then we have sort of in a, in a box, we try to put it in a box, all these doubts and desires and the struggle to love and pursue truth. And I mean, that's a large part of the journey, actually, right? And so this struggle, this being pulled in two directions uh, for people of faith, it can be seen by people in the world, people not of faith, people who who don't trust and follow Jesus. They they look at Christians and they see it as hypocrisy, right? Because we're saying, well, here's what we believe, but they also see us acting in this way, you know? And um, to the other religious people around us, they know, well, we should be shooting for uh, this example, but they also see us living in this way sometimes. And so it looks like a failure and inadequacy. Right? And so we find ourselves uh, really just being pulled apart and we embrace uh, secret sin and bad habits. We embrace loneliness and fear and panic and ultimately despair, discouragement, uh, hopelessness. And, and, and yet there's still this part of us that really wants uh, again, for those of us who are people of faith, really wants this book that we've read uh, to be true. We really want this Jesus we've heard about to be true. We really want what our understanding of God uh, to be true. For people who aren't of faith, still, you can uh, understand this idea that, uh, okay, I have all this uh, this loneliness and, and this despair, but I but I imagine this world where things are good and people are helping each other and people are good people, you know, and um, so uh, there's this sort of duality. We're just being pulled apart all the time, and because of that, sometimes we we hide things, we hide the dirty details of who we are, but we can sort of imagine that. Um, that, that good world for, again, for those of us of faith, we can imagine that clean and pure disciple that Jesus wants us to be. And so we're hopeful, but then we're also sort of ashamed and frightened at the disparity of life, right? So life is full of this duality. Everything is making choices and um, we feel it in everything there's this sin battles holiness it's good versus evil choosing this path over that one the the right thing versus the easy thing safety versus adventure purity versus comfort friends over boundaries fun over morals ethics over success peacemaking above victory abundance at the expense of depth renown at the expense of intimacy Every rose has a thorn, love, hate relationships, two steps forward, one step back, far and wide, upside down, to and fro, hit or miss, all or nothing, helter skelter, topsy turvy. And it is precisely into this world that scripture speaks. And it wastes no time. It's the first sentence. When God began creating heaven and earth, and the earth then was welter and waste, and darkness over the deep, and God's breath hovering over the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. So these are the opening lines of Robert Alter's translation of Genesis from his commentary, The Five Books of Moses. And um, I'll probably be using that a lot, and I'll talk about it more later. But uh, Genesis, you know, it's a series of stories about the beginning of everything, and they're woven together by some master storyteller. And in this new translation that Alter's done, I think the thread of light and dark will really jump off the page and grab your attention and help you see what uh, the author and ultimately what the, the Lord wants to tell you uh, about what it means to be a fallen human, but that you were created in God's image about this duality, about the light and the dark. And so I hope kind of going through Genesis together um, will give you hope for how things can be very good again, like they were in the beginning. So, um, uh, like I say, the series is called Light in the Darkness. And if you are um, looking forward to the vacation Bible school stories, you know, of Adam and Eve and Noah and the animals and Joseph and his uh, coat of many colors, you you might be disappointed. It's We'll read those stories, but we'll also not flinch away from their darker sides. 
So you know, we'll read about Adam and Eve, and we'll also read of the sin that begets the first murder of Cain slaughtering his brother Abel. And we'll read about Noah, but we'll also read about uh, his drunkenness and what Ham does and who Canaan is. And we'll read about Joseph in his coat, but we'll also read about the selfishness of his brothers and their attempted murder and their selling him into slavery and lying about his disappearance to their own father. Um, Genesis, like our lives, is often R-rated. It's lies, pride, drunkenness, murder, revenge, incest, prostitution, sexual assault. I mean, these are like the first few chapters, right? Um, but like our lives, it's also full of beauty and humor and love, uh, the justice of God, the intimacy of husband and wife, the nurturing mother, the doting father, promise and covenant, salvation and redemption. So the study will be as raw as the text is. The text can be pretty raw. But I hope that it will allow you to hope for the creation the Lord always wanted to be made new for you. Again, whatever your background is, whatever your understanding of Genesis is uh, coming into this. So um, let's just dive right into Genesis 1. Again, we're not going to take long tonight. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the notes that I have. But uh, as I uh, said a little earlier, the delay on... Um, what I'm doing and what I'm seeing happen in the live window is so great. Like 10 seconds makes it difficult to do any uh, back and forth. So I'll have to get to any comments and questions and stuff later, but I thank you everybody for being here. So uh, let me pose this question to you before we go any farther. If you were going to write a religious text, how would you start it? If you were going to write a religious text, how would you start it? So um, just some examples here, and this is not, I'm not a high scholar, so if, um, be graceful with me for any mistakes I may make in pronunciation or facts or anything like that, but uh, just a little sample. So uh, Quran begins with uh, a prayer against Allah's anger, a prayer to find favor, which includes the lines, it is you we worship, uh, you we ask for for help, guide us to the straight path, the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favor, not of those who have evoked your anger or those who are astray. So it's a prayer from those writing or those speaking to uh, the God that they're writing about. Book of Mormon begins, I, Nafi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father. And then it goes on to talk about some sort of revelation style religious visions uh, had by his father in Jerusalem, which caused him to write a book. And then now Nafi is now writing a book about the things that his father wrote about. And uh, then I think those showed up on some golden tablets, which Joseph Smith wrote about. So it's just sort of handed down several times there. Uh, the Hindu uh, Bhagavad Gita begins with war. Uh, chapter one, three, oh, respected preceptor, please behold the almighty army of the Pandavas arranged in military phalanx by your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. Uh, the Babylonian seven tablets of the history of creation begin with the gods being created after the primeval mother and father of the earth mingle their waters together, and it like immediately dissembles into turmoil, chaos, and war. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, he who the heart of all matters hath proven, let him teach the nation. He who all knowledge possesseth, therein shall he school all the people. And then it proceeds with the description of this god-man warrior. Uh, the Buddhist text begins with sort of a metaphysical philosophy. Um, at that time, the Bhagavan said to the Bhikkhus, you should observe the impermanence of form. One who observes thusly observes correctly. One who correctly observes gives rise to disenchantment. One who is disenchanted exhausts delight and craving. One who exhausts delight and craving is called liberated in mind. So um, you see sort of, sort of a metaphysical philosophy there, sort of thinking through some things, right? Very interesting. Uh, some important documents or founding documents just straight up tell you what they're about at the beginning, right? So think about the founding documents of our nation. Uh, arguably, religious texts, uh, some think so because they refer to nature's God and some act uh, as such because of their worship of them. Um, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. Of course, from the Declaration of Independence and we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution 
for the United States of America. I probably could have done that from memory, but I would have to sing it. Nobody wants that. Um, Steve Martin has a song called Atheists Don't Have No Songs. He's got a, an album or a book called uh, Atheist Hymnal or something like that. Sort of um, obviously there's a, a irony there. Um, atheists may not have songs, but they, they have texts and not exactly religious texts, but uh, definitely cornerstone works. And so consider one of them uh, beginning the beginning of uh, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking begins this way. A well-known scientist, some say it was Bertrand Russell, once gave a public lecture on astronomy. He described how the Earth orbits around the sun and how the sun in turn orbits around the center of a vast collection of stars called our galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a little old lady at the back of the room got up and said, what you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. Well, the scientist gave a superior smile before replying, what is the tortoise standing on? You're very clever, young man, very clever, said the old lady, but it's turtles all the way down. So this book begins with uh, entertainment, you know, uh, an anecdote, a joke. And um, so th there's some examples of just how the beginnings of some religious texts or some foundational texts, some important texts, keystone texts, cornerstone texts. So I return to the original question then. The original question, if you were to write a foundational religious sacred text, if you were God, how would you start? Let me, let me ask you this. This is a different question, but kind of comes at it from another direction. So imagine one of your grandparents writes you a letter. Okay. They know in a few years they'll be gone. You're too young now to appreciate the relationship like they do. Maybe you're a small child in this example, okay? So they want to leave behind for you their great learning, their wisdom for living, uh, where you came from and why. Now, the final work ends up being a hefty tome, but the, here's the question, how would it begin? So your grandparents want to leave behind all their wisdom all their love for you ends up being a big, thick book. But how does it begin? May I offer a suggestion? I remember the day you were born. And what would follow would not yet be great wisdom, would not yet be full of knowledge. Your grandmother would not write about the medical process of how a baby is formed or born. Your grandfather would not give the farmer's almanac reading for that day, right? No, they would tell you a story. They would tell the story and they would tell you the events, but they would concentrate on the relationships. Right? Uh, your uncle was late. Uh, your father called you sweet girl over and over. I couldn't stop crying. It's about relationships, right? Uh, my niece, Annabelle, was born on September 11th, 2001. And... Many of you remember what you were doing that day. Uh, I was driving from North Carolina to Murfreesboro to see the newborn Annabelle, not knowing what all else was going to happen that day. And um, by the time I got there, she had already been born. And I remember the stories that I was told. And I remember the story of, uh, you know, the doctor holding her up after she was delivered and saying, may this child uh, be a symbol of who's really in charge of this world. And I get emotional now, even, you know, thinking about it. Um, Annabelle had a, had a tear duct that was clogged for several months. And so pretty much every picture we had of her had a, had a little tear uh, coming out in those early pictures that we had of her. These are the way I think if your grandmother was going to write you a big book, this is how it would begin. And I think that's a, a good place to begin understanding how we should now turn and look at, at the Bible, at scripture. If God is benevolent, if God exists, if God is benevolent, if God loves us in a way that we can never comprehend, it sure seems like he would start with the beginning of things and focus on 
the relationships. So, so your Bible doesn't start with religious ritual. It doesn't start with sacred law. It doesn't start with rules for being a follower or else. It doesn't start with commands to people, though it does begin with a command. Uh, it does not start with cosmic war between the gods. It does not start with an introduction stating what the book is about and how to read it. Um, it, it, it doesn't even start with an author. I mean, we, you know, we attribute these books to Moses, but uh, that's just sort of an attribution. We, we really don't know who wrote these texts of Genesis. It begins without a lot of things that, that we might expect if we were looking at it uh, from an intellectual standpoint. But when we look at it from a relationship standpoint, we can see very clearly it starts with a story. When God began creating heaven and earth, and the earth then was welter and waste, and darkness over the deep, and God's breath hovering over the waters, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. And it was evening, and it was morning, first day. So, as I said before, this is written by, uh, this translation was done by a man named Robert Alter. Robert Alter is Jewish, he's not Christian. He's uh, a professor of Hebrew studies, Hebrew literature at uh, UC Berkeley, I think. And he's now translated the entire Hebrew scriptures, and you can get them in a beautiful three-volume set, which David and Renee Sproul's got me for uh, Christmas a while back. It's a beautiful uh, hardback set. But you also get it as an ebook. You can get just the five books of Moses. Uh, as an ebook or as a paperback, hardback. Uh, so if you wanted to read his translation and commentary, basically what he does is he provide an introduction for every book and then he will translate it based on his understanding of uh, Hebrew and then provide commentary for why he translated it the way that he did. And all translation and commentaries have a specific purpose and they will usually tell you the purpose in the beginning. So um, if you look at translations that you find, uh, those of you who are Bible readers, you get on your phone, you get on the Version app, and there's all these different translations. Well, what's different about them? Some of them, like uh, the Message or New Living Translation, are more of a thought for thought. They're, they're a little bit paraphrased. They're easier to understand, easier to read, but they're not exactly like the original text. And then you have some like the NASB or the English Standard Version that are more like the original text, but maybe they're a little clunky to read, you know? And then you have some that are kind of in the middle, like NIV or something like that. And so every translation sort of has a goal when it's being translated. Alter's goal is to preserve something almost no English translation seeks to preserve, and that is narrative style. What he's trying to preserve is how the story is told. That's what he's trying to preserve. Very few other English translations do that. They're interested in preserving the content, which is great, and we need those translations primarily. But uh, narrative style is just as important as the content in some circumstances. Let me give you an example. If I am texting with you, and I send you, uh, um, you send me a text and say, um, you know, hey, is it a is it a big disco party over at your parents' house right now? And I text you back, say, oh yeah, you know us, we're we're uh, got the dance floor going right now. Okay, if you know me and you know my parents, you know that's not true, right? You know, we're not dancing. We're downstairs watching Jeopardy yelling at the television. But um, if if that's the way I was to respond to you, you would understand that as irony. You would understand that as sarcasm, right? And so imagine somebody 200 years later coming across these text messages somehow. They would say, oh, wow, this Paul Skidmore and his parents, they really like to dance at their house. It's very interesting, right? Because they don't have the narrative style. They don't understand the context, right? So they're just looking at the content and by only looking at the content without the narrative style, they completely, they've actually got the wrong meaning. They've got the opposite meaning of what's intended, right? Narrative style also informs how we're going to understand something. Okay. So if I'm telling you about the beginning of the universe and I say, okay, in the early picoseconds of the universe, uh, these chemicals were mixed and this kind of reaction happened, you're going to be listening like with a, with a uh, pen and pencil, you're going to be taking notes. This is an academic thing that we're looking at here, right? Um, if I'm going to describe it in, in poetic language and uh, describe the beauty of it, then you're just going to sit there and sort of enjoy the beauty of it with me. You're going to listen to it differently. Um, if I were to tell you that um, I left uh, my children at the house yesterday and while I was gone, this uh, cat came over and they all played and they had a good time. You'd be listening, sort of waiting for the point of the story um, and not really understanding maybe why I'm telling you the story. But if I read you Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat, you wouldn't be listening for information. 
you would be trying to figure out how this applied to your life or to my life. You'd just be enjoying the rhythm of the story, the telling of the story, right? So uh, narrative style is very important to understanding the content. So um, let's go back and look at Alter's translation. Uh, when God began creating heaven and earth. Now, I know that all of us are used to Genesis 1-1 beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Both are sort of acceptable translations. What Alter's done is, is really the more literal translation from the text. And one reason he preserves it this way is because in the Hebrew, the first couple of verses of Genesis, as we see them, are actually one sentence. And they culminate in a very specific act, and that is the word of God. That is God speaking, the first time God speaks. So when God began creating the heaven and the earth, here's the way things were. Earth was welter and waste. Tohu abohu is the Hebrew. Like when we say topsy-turvy, helter-skelter, that tohu abohu, it means exactly what it sounds like. It was just welter and waste. It was just chaos. The earth was just a big blob. And darkness was over the deep. Darkness in uh, Hebrew literature is just always representative of uh, chaos and danger and sin and evil, right? Uh, the deep, talking about the water, the abyss, uh, any reference to water pretty much in the Old Testament is all about um, uh, fear and chaos. And so you have the, you have tohu abohu, you have welter and waste, you have darkness, you have the abyss, and God's breath hovers over that. It's, on it's over that. It's above that. And being above that speaks a command, let there be light. And the very next phrase is, and there was light. And in Hebrew, it's even more parallel than it is than it ever could be in English because of the way Hebrew functions. So basically, in Hebrew, the way it works is God said, light be, and light be. Showing that exactly what God said to do is exactly what happened, right? God said, light be, and light be. God saw the light, that it was good, divided the light from the darkness, called the light day, the darkness he called night, and it was evening and it was morning, first day. It doesn't say the first day. There's no article there. First day. And you can hear there's almost a little lilt to the way that he's written it, right? So what you start to see as you go through these early uh, verses of Genesis is that it's, it, it seems like it was a song, Okay. So, in, in saying that it is a song, in saying that it may be poetic, I'm not in, in any way saying that it isn't true. In fact, I think there is so much scientific truth in the early portions of Genesis that we only now in the last 100 years, some, some of these things in the last 30 to 50 years, have really discovered that actually uh, there's a lot of truth in some of the language that is used in Genesis 1. So, I'm not trying to say that Genesis 1 is not scientifically true. What I am trying to say is, I don't think that is the aim of Genesis 1. I don't think being scientifically true is its aim. It may be scientifically true, but I don't think that that is its aim. Its aim is to be a song to be remembered. Why? Why? Because it shows who did everything, that God did it, that it did it. It was done at his command. It was created at his command. Again, it's all about relationship, right? So, um, Alter is still trying to adhere to that original text, but if I were to take his narrative style idea a little further, it, uh, we, if we knew the ancient Hebrew in the context that they did, we might hear it something like this. Okay. So I've, this is, I've written this. This is not a translation. This is a paraphrase. Don't take this literally, but just, just, just listen to it. When God began forming all that's in sight, the universe welter and waste in the night, where the deep it was heard, God's breath water stirred, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, made good in God's way. He took the dark and kept it away. The dark he called night, and the light he called day. And the dusk and the dawn were first day. So if I started telling you about the creation of the universe in that way, you wouldn't be listening with a pencil and a paper and, and a telescope, right? You would be um, trying to remember the song. You'd want to sing the song, too. You would be listening for just the beauty of the poetry, right? And so uh, I think that we can go to Genesis and get science, okay? But I don't think that's the initial aim of Genesis. I think Genesis wants to primarily help us understand our relationship with God. That in the beginning, God was over everything. And everything that is good began by his command and by his word over and over again in Scripture from the first sentence of Genesis to the end of Revelation, the word of God, the word that God speaks 
is so important. And you see that right here in this opening sentence of Genesis. And um, so there's a lot of other things that we could talk about, but what I want to show you is that in this opening sentence, you have the light and you have the darkness. That thing that we talked about at the very beginning of this stream, that when we walk around, we feel the desire to be a good person, but we also feel sort of these selfish things sort of pulling us in another direction. The very first sentence of Genesis speaks to that. God says, I know the world that you live in because I made it. I made the good stuff. I made all the good things. And now I'm here to have a relationship with you and help bring those back together so that everything will be good. And isn't that the the story of the song of Genesis? That when God did things, they were good. And when he was all done doing them, it was very good, right? And so that's what we're in our lives constantly trying to get back to is sort of that 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 very goodness. That's what we're after. That's what we want to be. Even those of us who are not people of, of scripture, even those of us who, who don't follow Christ, who, who are atheists, still we, we feel walking around the desire to, to help our fellow man, the desire to be part of something bigger, right? And so that's spoken to right in this first sentence of Genesis. And so sort of uh, what I submit to you is that the opening sentence of Genesis is really it's the entire summary of the universe. The rest of Genesis 1 is an expansion of that first sentence. And the rest of Genesis is an expansion of that first sentence. And the rest of the Torah is an expansion of that sentence. And the rest of the Old Testament with the writings and the prophets and the wisdom and the stories and the chronicles, that's an expansion of that first sentence. And when Jesus shows up, he comes to reiterate that first sentence and shows and show what that means for every step of life and every choice that we make. All of the New Testament, it's just an expansion of that first sentence. The beauty of Revelation and what how John says things are going to be later, that is all just a reiteration more details on that first sentence and that God in the first sentence of scripture tells us everything that we need to know. Now it might not be all the details that we need to know, but it's all encapsulated in that first sentence. That's a beautiful thing to me. I hope that that's a beautiful thing to you. I think a lot of people look at the old Testament and it sounds clunky and they don't understand it. And there's a context that they're not familiar with and they don't read it. And a lot of us, you know, we're new Testament Christians and the old Testament, and us, some old people, and I don't know what they were doing. And, but, but you, you can't really have a robust understanding of the new Testament unless you understand the Hebrew heritage uh, from which it was birthed, which begins with this sentence right here with Genesis one. Um, some of you may look skeptically at scripture, may look skeptically at the Bible. And I, I hope that you can, uh, come to Genesis one, not with, you know, your, your, um, uh, physics and your astronomy books. I mean, we, let's have that discussion. That's fine. But, but I hope that you come to it first for what, for its intention, which is let, let's recognize the beauty that, that there's anything that things were created, that we have a life, that we have a universe. Um, let's recognize the beauty of that and maybe sing a song about it. So there's another book that I used when I was doing my class on Genesis with the college and careers class. And it was recommended to me, recommended to me by Bobby, Bobby Blaylock. And um, it's an interesting book. It's a little heady, but uh, I like things that are a little heady. So um, but it's called The Beginning of Wisdom, Reading Genesis. And it's by Leon R. Cass. And you can get that. Uh, paperback on, uh, I know on Amazon, probably other places. I've not seen an ebook for it um, because I have the paperback. If there was an ebook, I would have that instead. But there is this sentence from sort of one of the opening chapters of this book. And uh, I just want to share it with you. So this is from the beginning of wisdom, reading Genesis by Leon Cass. Is it possible to find, institute, and preserve a way of life responsive to both the promise and the peril of the human creature that accords with man's true understanding, uh, man's true standing in the world, and that serves to perfect his godlike possibilities. Okay. So not saying that humans are God. What he's saying is we've been made in the image of God. And so there are many parts of us that are godlike. And those are the good things that we're trying to strive after all the time. And we're always sort of held back by the peril. Uh, whether it's the peril of things going on around us, the peril of uh, other people making decisions that affect us, or the peril of our own decisions. So let me just read it one more time. Is it possible to find, institute, 
and preserve a way of life responsive to both the promise and the peril of the human creature that accords with man's true standing in the world and that serves to perfect his godlike possibilities. In other words, how can we live with the light and the darkness knowing that we're made in the image of God, but sometimes we're just such crappy people? How can we do it? How can we do both? Is, is, is there something where we can understand, you know, the failings that we have in proper context, but always be striving for something better? Is there something that speaks to that? And uh, what Cass is saying, because this is in the opening of his book, is that Genesis speaks to that. It speaks to it right out of the gate. It speaks to it right out in this first sentence. You have light and you have darkness. The darkness is separated from the light and the light is very good. Everything's created by the word of God and everything that the word of God creates is very good. That when God created um, uh, all of the elements of the universe and uh, the planets and the vegetation and the animals, it was all good. And when man, uh, when God created man, it was very good. And um, the, the opening sentences of Genesis let us know God did it. God loves us. And we are made in, uh, in his image. And so while we are often capable of great evil, we are also capable of great good. And uh, the, the choice is ours. Sketches from Scripture is a production of Parabolos, the production company of author and filmmaker Paul Andrew Skidmore. Subscribe to this podcast and more at skidmore.substack.com.